Alright, what is up everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Michael Dorsey Show, the new podcast. This is going to be episode two. I am uber excited for uh, how well everybody received the last episode. Um, I thank everybody for all of the support that we have going forward. Um, I start every single one of these off with saying, um, if you can, make sure you like and subscribe to the YouTube video. Um, following this page is always a help as well. For the people on the YouTube side, if you want to watch the show live, you can join my Twitch channel. Um, the links are going to be below in the description. We also have a wonderful Instagram page where I post memes and jokes and things like that because there's got to be a duality to life right? We're going to have this show once a week and we're going to be miserable at the end of it. And we're all going to sit here and go, what the hell is wrong with us? And why is this going on? And why are we doing this to ourselves? And I apologize for that. So throughout the week, I'm going to post funny content that's going to make people laugh. Um, actually, we can go through one of my more recent posts. That way we all start the day off with a nice smile because we kind of need it at all times. Let's be honest. If Instagram ever loads up. Uh, oh, I remember my Instagram password. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't remember. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on to that and we'll start the show off as a, as a regular thing. Um, definitely the link to the description for my Instagram is down below. Um, and we're going to start it right up. All right. So our first story today is a double-edged sword of a story. Um, we have the Biden administration discussing a $450,000 payment to migrants separated at the border. Now, is this 450000 for all of the people, or is it $450,000 for per person? Because if it's per person, that's fucking nuts, regardless. But this story broke on October 31st of 2021, so this is a few days old. Um, and what happened today? Well, what happened today is Biden rejects the $450,000 payments. He says that's not going to happen. Of course, it's not going to happen. Um, it was never going to happen. This was what we call a election push. So basically... What they were doing is they created a fake policy that they were going to possibly enact in order to force people to vote for Democrats in this most recent election cycle. It didn't work. Didn't work. Um, this is just what they do. This is just what they do. They'll lie. They'll lie to you and they'll go, all right, 450000 to each person affected. We could do that for you if you make sure and you go out and you vote for our, our people. So why does Biden reject it? Well, because it's insane. <laughs> President Biden on Wednesday said migrants separated from family members at the border would not receive hundreds of thousands of dollars for damages inflicted by the Trump era policy. It's funny that we were saying this because the Trump era policy is today's policy. Is today's policy. Joe Biden is maintaining the Trump era stay in Mexico policy. It's his policy. It's not a Trump era policy. This is Joe Biden's policy. Rejecting an option for monetary compensation that has been floated in negotiations with lawyers representing the families. They're trying, man. They're trying to get something for these people that were displaced. They need to get something. They need to get something. I don't give a shit if it's, if it's something to help them back in their own countries. I don't really give a shit what it is. But to be fair and to be certain, it, it, what was done to them is absurd. What is continuing to be done is not the answer to it. We're not having the right conversation. We, we talk about this a lot where it's, we, we need to have the right conversation. And $450,000 is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to be taken out of your pocket for somebody that has nothing to do with you. That's a lot of money. So representatives of the migrant families and government officials had discussed giving families $450,000 for each member affected by former President Donald Trump's zero tolerance party, which led to the separation of about 5,500 children from their parents, according to the people familiar with the matter. People familiar with the matter. Okay. But when asked on Wednesday about compensating the migrants, Mr. Biden denied the option was on the table. 450000 per person? Is that what you're saying? Mr. Biden said when asked by Fox News reporter Peter Ducey about the payments. That's not going to happen. Of course, it's not going to happen. Um, this was a ploy the whole time. Uh, it was a big news story. They ramped it up. And it was ramped up on both sides right? The Democrats are going, oh, there's a possibility we're going to help these migrant families. And the Republicans are going, oh, look at what the Democrats want to do. They want to steal your money. So either way, this was a talking point that was going to get around to immigrants. And it was going to make them think, oh, this administration likes us better than the last administration. But the truth of the matter is, is they don't. They don't care about you. They don't care. This is all a fucking ploy and a joke. This news came out in an attempt to subvert 
all of the elections that were coming out. And we're actually going to we're going to immediately get in to the election after we continue to talk about Biden, because Biden is continuing to make an absolute mockery of your democracy. And it, the, the fact that everybody around is just being compliant with it is insane to me. So I think we got to continue this. Um, so ooh, I was actually reading this one a little bit because this one's actually insane. Uh, oh, look at these ads. We get rid of them. OK, uh, Biden. Businesses have until after the holidays to implement Biden COVID vaccine mandate. So what kind of businesses? This is important. This conversation is actually important. To have. The newly released rules issued by the occupational OSHA. This is we, we're going to talk about OSHA a lot. OSHA is not a bad organization. Not a good one either. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration under the Labor Department apply to businesses with 100 or more employees. Now, why is this important? Well, because it doesn't affect your bar. It doesn't affect, you know, most of your convenience stores, right? You're going to go to the fucking, uh, you're going to go to CVS. It doesn't really affect CVS, you know? Um, maybe it does. Maybe they, they haven't really stressed this out yet that it's corporations. For some reason, the word businesses always irks me. Because businesses doesn't mean corporation, right? Because if it meant corporations, then it meant every single chain and every single place. So does McDonald's have a vaccine mandate? Because they have way more than 100 employees. But per business, they don't. So this is something that I think needs to be fleshed out. Honestly. Because this is very, very vague. Very, very vague. Businesses have until January 4th to make sure their workers have received the shots necessary to be fully vaccinated. Or what? Or what? All unvaccinated workers must begin wearing masks by December 5th to provide a negative COVID test on a weekly basis after the January deadline, according to the requirements. Okay. Companies are not required to pay for or provide the tests unless they are otherwise required to by state or local laws or in labor union contracts. Fucked. You're fucked. If you have a principal and you don't want to get the vaccine, you're fucked. They're going to monetarily tax you weekly on a weekly basis. They're going to tax you. This is fucked up. The Biden administration ordered U.S. companies Thursday to ensure their employees are fully vaccinated by January 1st or regular testing for COVID-19 to give them a reprieve over the holidays before the long awaited and hotly contested mandate takes effect. Uh, workers must receive their final dose of a two-dose vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna, or a single dose of Johnson & Johnson by that date, according to the requirements. The administration on Thursday also pushed back the deadline for federal contractors to comply with a stricter set of vaccine requirements, and they'll continue to push that back. They'll continue to push that back. All of this doesn't matter because Congress people's staff don't have to be vaccinated. So if you work for a congressperson, you don't have to be vaccinated. This mandate is only for businesses with 100 or more people. So if you're, I don't know, Nancy Pelosi, none of your aides need to be vaccinated. You can say that they do, but they don't. They just don't. So rules for you, but not for me. That's what this is. That's exactly what this is. Uh, companies also have until December 5th to offer paid time for employees to get vaccinated and paid sick leave for them to recover from any side effects. Go get sick. This is so stupid. This is the absolute dumbest shit ever. OSHA, which policies work, which polices, okay, which polices workplace safety for the Labor Department will provide sample implementation plans and fact sheets among other materials to help companies adopt the new rules. Okay. Yeah, nothing wrong with OSHA doing this. Oh, this is a forcing thing anyway. This is, OSHA has to do this, right? Um, OSHA will also conduct on-site workplace inspections to make sure companies comply with the rules. This is not going to happen. OSHA does not have enough people working for them. We've, we know this. We know this. A senior administration official said penalties for non-compliance can range from $13,653 per serious violation to $136,532 if a company willfully violates the rules. And there will be companies that willfully violate the rules. 
The vaccine mandate, which covers 84 million people employed in the private sector, in the private sector, not the public sector, the private sector. The public sector people don't need to be vaccinated. I, what is going on? What's going on here? Speaking of vaccines, here's Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers probably had one of the biggest uh, oopsie daisy go fuck yourselves of all time. This is top 10 of all time. Aaron Rodgers tests positive for COVID-19, rules for unvaccinated players when Packers QB should return, and more. So what's all happening here? So what happened? Aaron Rodgers tested positive Wednesday morning for COVID-19, and the Packers conformed, confirmed the backup QB, Jordan Love, will start Sunday night's game against the Chiefs. The sequence made clear that Rodgers is unvaccinated. He most definitely is. Why is that? Why is that? Well, unvaccinated players who test positive must isolate at least 10 days, even if they are asymptomatic. Vaccinated players, however, can return following a positive test as soon as they produce two negative tests with 24 hours in between, as long as they are asymptomatic. In other words, Rodgers would at least have a chance to play Sunday if he were vaccinated. Okay. Didn't Rodgers say he had been vaccinated? No. <laughs> no, he didn't. In August, a reporter in Green Bay asked him if he had been vaccinated for COVID-19. He answered by saying in part, yeah, I've been immunized. <laughs> so Aaron Rodgers is a absolute complete savage. Um, this is what you need to tell people. This is just what you need to say from now on. So nobody knows because it's none of their fucking business. This is not a person's business. Your medical information is not people's business. It's not. Somebody asks you if you've been vaccinated, even if you have been, tell them to go fuck themselves. Seriously. This is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Have you been vaccinated for polio? Because I've been. Who fucking cares? Who cares? It literally doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. Is there a difference? No one thought so at the time. The CDC defies vaccination as the act of inducing a vaccine into the body to produce the protection from a specific disease. Its definition for immunization is a process by which a person becomes protected against the disease through vaccination. So, kind of didn't lie. I mean, he definitely didn't lie. He said, I've been immunized. Good for you, Aaron. Good for you. Why did he think he was protected against COVID-19? First of all, nobody's protected from COVID-19. If you have taken the vaccine, you have the same amount of percentage to receive the virus as somebody who has not been. I want you to understand that. We literally the other day, uh, the White House core press guy said that everyone is going to get COVID. Everyone. You're going to get COVID-19. It's going to happen. The vaccine is going to make it so that it's less effective on you. And that's fine. But you're going to get it. If you haven't gotten it and you took the vaccine, you're going to get it. It's going to happen. Just so you know. What did the agreement say about vaccination? So it offered multiple paths towards a fully vaccinated status. They include 14 days past the two-shot regimen of the Pfizer or Moderna, 14 days past the one-shot regimen of Johnson & Johnson, one shot of any vaccine if the player had also tested positive after August 26th and has a total antibody level of... What the fuck? Come on, man. Come on. What are we doing? What are we doing? What is this? What is this? Why are we doing this to ourselves? Absent one of the outcomes, Rogers was required to follow protocols for any unvaccinated player. Uh, okay, here are the, the rules for the NFL. This is what the NFL... As others have noted, the NFL and the NFLPA have pulled together their various COVID-19 protocols for the summer. Boiled down, there are very few rules for vaccinated people, while many of the 2020 rules remain for those who are unvaccinated. So, if you're not fully vaccinated, the testing is required every day. Wow, okay. Uh, masks required at club facility and during travel must remain physically distanced from others in club facility. It's football. They're playing football. The sport is to hit people and touch people. We know this, right? We know that that's what this sport is. Uh, travel restrictions in effect. <laughs> Uh, a 15 player limit in weight room. I don't know what the fuck difference that makes. Uh, players must be physically distanced in meal room, may not eat with teammates. Yeah. Staff must grab and go, no meals in cafeteria. No social media, marketing, or sponsorship activities permitted. So let's see if there's there more to that. 
Hold on. That is, this is nuts. Okay. Let's actually take a look at this. Because this is insane. May not use sonar steam room. <sighs> Jesus. These guys are really oppressive lately, huh? Uh, may not leave team hotel to eat in restaurants. May not interact with anyone outside of team traveling party during team travel. Okay. Now, these are all la layovers and leftovers from 2020, right? So, I mean, some of it is kind of understandable in a sense. I don't necessarily think that these are bad rules. I think these are, for the most part, good rules. I scoffed at a couple of them. Travel restrictions, in effect. Like, what are you going to do? They're playing football. He's got to travel all across the country all the time. I bet you he's still going wherever the fuck they're playing. Or if he was somewhere, he's traveled back to Green Bay. Like, this is not a... These are not... It's not a real rule for a professional athlete. We can't do that. Players must be physically distanced in meal room. Uh, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? None of this makes any sense or difference. I can't imagine any of this affecting anyone else. I don't know. This is nutty to me. This whole story is a little nuts. Uh, Ken, Ken Seifert. It's a very, very good, uh, very good chart you got your hands on here. This is impressive. Um, why is this important? Well, are there are those the only rules unvaccinated players must follow? No, an unvaccinated player, for example, can't gather in a group of more than three players, coaches, or other members of the football operations. So this is, as a quarterback, this would be extraordinarily uh, limiting, very limiting on what you can and can't do. I'm sure these rules were not followed. I'm actually positive these rules were not followed. So in in that way, and in a sense. Did the NFL discipline him for any of this? As of this moment, the league has not responded to questions about that. The NFL has the ability to fine players at least 14000 for first events violating COVID-19 protocols with a maximum of 50000 I don't know. I don't know. I don't think um, I don't think they should be worried at all. The most important thing to worry about is Rogers' health in both the short term and long term. No, I don't think so. I think he's fine. The best case scenario is he'll rejoin the team the day after the Packers' November 14th game against the Seahawks, so it's not out of the question that he could miss two games, and that's assuming he tests the negative and is asymptomatic at the 10-day mark. Chatter throughout the day Wednesday centered on the surprise of Rodgers' unvaccinated status, but the health of all involved should be top priority. Yeah, I agree. The health of everyone should be uh, a top priority. Um, if, if Mr. Rodgers is okay, who cares? Who cares? If he's fine and he's living fine and he's he's gonna have he's living a good life, who cares? Who cares? That's just me. So we're gonna go into the fun stuff today. So today's for the fun stuff. Today we're going to do uh, meltdowns. We like meltdowns. Meltdowns are my favorite. Glenn Youngkin, Mister Youngkin. Racial, white racial anxiety strikes again. New York Times. This is an opinion piece by Charles M. Blow. Uh, Mr. Blow is actually a very, very good opinion columnist. I actually enjoy most of his work. Um, I'm not sure about this title. We're going to see if this title holds any water to the article. We've noticed that they love to make titles, and the, the article's got nothing to do with it. They disagree with the, the title in the article. It's hilarious. Anyway, let's start from the top. Uh, Glenn Youngkin's defeat of Terry McAuliffe. I cannot say that guy's name. I've been trying for like three days to get his name right. McAuliffe? Is it Aulife? I don't know. In the Virginia governor's race, shocked some, but it resulted from multiple factors. Democrats still haven't delivered on their promises or moved major legislation, their infrastructure, social spending, voting rights bills through Congress. This is all true. This is all true. This is where we're living in a world. We're living in a world where they expect you to vote for people who break their promises. That's what we're doing. That's what we're living in the world with. This is all about this. White racial anxiety strikes again. And in the first paragraph, the first fucking paragraph, Democrats still haven't delivered on their promises or moved major legislation 
their infrastructure, social spending, voting rights bills. They haven't done a fucking thing yet. But it's white racial anxiety. That's what it is. Of course, there are structural historical patterns that still hold true in states like Virginia, where voters tend to punish whichever party controls the White House. This is true. So this is what I call a grass is greener problem that we do have in this country. Um, we don't. The reason why we are lacking progression is because we're flip flopping. So because because we look and we go, ah, the Democrats aren't doing the right thing. We get rid of them. Then we put a Republican in. And then the Democrats go, oh, the Republican's racist. And then we're like, oh, we don't want racist. So we move them out of the way and we put another Democrat in. And we're like, oh my God, Democrats suck. This is just the cycle that we continue to go through. This is just what we've been doing now for the last like 50 fucking years. It's not working. It's not working. And Virginia is a place where this happens. They tend to punish the party that controls the White House. There's a reason for this. Because the party that controls the White House is usually not doing what they said they were going to do. The people of Virginia are the only woke people on the fucking planet, apparently. You, we have it. So the way their governor race works is that two years after the presidential election, Virginia has their governor race. The same as for New York. So when you're sitting there and you're looking at it as a voter and you're like, I voted for Joe Biden. I voted for Joe Biden because Joe Biden said he was going to give me this. He was going to give me this. He was going to give me this. And I think the Democrats are going to finally do what they say they're going to do. And now, you, now you're fucking, how many, you're, you're almost a year in, not a fucking thing has been done. He put out thousands of executive orders, none of which are things that he promised for you. And they expect you to vote for his guy. No, no, that's not how this works. It's not how this works. But what can't be denied is the degree to which Youngkin successfully activated and unleashed white racial anxiety, positioning it in its most important form as the protection of the vulnerable, innocent, and helpless children. Yep. So in this case, the white victims in supposed distress were children. Yes. So Mr. Youngkin was worried about what's been being taught to children in our schools. And he was so worried about it that he ran on the platform as a businessman. And that is what won him the election. Well, it's not true. It's not true. It's not the only thing. It's a literal contradictory paragraphs. Well, what won? The fact that Democrats aren't doing what they're supposed to do? Or the fact that we're not happy with the way our children are being taught. I'm still confused as to what racial white racial anxiety is going on. This is all just uh, this is all just true. This is all just true. Um, and honestly, this is such bullshit that this is how we're going to say this. But what can't be denied is the degree to which Youngkin successfully activated and unleashed white racial anxiety, positioning it in its most potent form as the protection of the vulnerable, innocent, and helpless. I remember Nancy Pelosi every fucking Sunday morning talking about food insecure children. Every fucking Sunday morning through 2020, the words food insecure children was fucking coming out of her mouth. So fuck you. Fuck you. Youngkin homed in on critical race theory, even though critical race theory, as Youngkin imagined it, isn't being taught in his state schools. But that didn't matter. No, it didn't matter because it exists. It's a thing that exists. So this is why we have to have this conversation. So Mr. Young, whether you agree or disagree with critical race theory, that's not why we're here right now. We're here to talk about why Mr. Youngkin deserves to be governor of this state and why he's the better choice, because that's all it is. What ended up happening was, was he's the better choice of the two men. He just was. He was the obvious better choice because he actually ran on something that fucking matters. Something that matters. Could you imagine... Could you imagine something that actually fucking matters to people is their children being taught bullshit in classes? How insane. There are people who want to believe the fabrication because it justifies their fears about displacement, powerlessness, and vulnerability. Okay. I suppose. It's an interesting sentence. In fact, the frenzy around critical race theory is just the latest in a long line of manufactured outrages meant to tap into the same... Fear and the strategy has provided desperate has proved desperate depressingly effective. Wow, can't speak. Um, yes, yes, it has. Uh, because we've read the critical race theory manifestos, and they're racist. They're racist. I don't know what to tell you. They're segregation. They're they're uh, pro segregation and they're racist. So yeah. 
Uh, there was the fear of race mixing among children. I don't know what the fuck that is. Race mixing among children, including the notion that black boys might be dating white girls following the desegregation ruling. And what is going on? What is this sentence? In fact, the friend... In fact, the frenzy around critical race theory is just the latest in a long line of manufactured outrages meant to tap into the same fear, and the strategy has proved depressingly effective. There was the fear of race mixing among children. Okay. Okay. This is years, man. In the 60s, there was fear. In the fucking 50s, there was fear of race mixing. You can't do this. Including the notion that black boys might be dating white girls following the desegregation ruling in Brown versus Board of Education. This was the thing that they were talking about. Yes. This is the thing they were worried about and they were talking about. But this was also a thing that Democrats were talking about were worried about. Just saying. By the way, there was a variation on the ancient and dusty fear peddled during Reconstruction that not only were black men incapable of governing, but that their rapacious nature also put white women at risk of rape and devilment. All right. It's not the 50s. It's not the 60s. It's not the 50s. It's not the fucking same thing. It's not the same thing. And you're literally against desegregation, but you're for critical race theory? So you haven't, you don't know what critical race theory is then. Then you don't know. Because if your literal example of what's bad is that we were afraid of desegregation, then you should not be for critical race theory. I, what? There was a fear of a collapse in the, of the Southern way of life and society following the successes of the civil rights movement that gave rise to the Republican Southern strategy. Yes, this is true. Richard Nixon used the fear of a lost generation to launch his disastrous war on drugs, which was not really a war on drugs at all, but yet another way to ignite waste, white racial anxiety. Well, no. You can be a little bit more bold and say Richard Nixon's war on drugs was racist. I, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. It was mainly aimed in, at black people in black neighborhoods. I agree. I don't know what has to do with white racial anxiety. Is it because white people are afraid of drugged up people? Because I am. I'm afraid of people on, on meth living in my neighborhoods. Yes. I don't know why that's white racial anxiety. Maybe it's me. Leave a comment in the thing below if I'm if I'm if I have white racial anxiety. Am I Am I anxious about my white race? I don't know. Uh, Nixon's Jane J aide, John Ehrlichman, <laughs> would later tell Harper's Magazine, this fucking guy. <laughs> the Nixon campaign in 1968, the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. This is not wrong. This is not wrong. This is very, very far from wrong. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. John Ehrlichman. Can the same be said for the vaccine? Are they doing the same thing for the unvaccinated people? Because this is looking extraordinarily familiar. You're telling me that if you associate what people are doing with crime, we would vilify them and not like them and say they should die? Hmm. Hmm. So you're telling me we've been doing the same shit since the 60s? Okay. Very good. Honestly, you <laughs> <sighs> this is the part where we take a sec. We got to take a second, guys. We got to take a second. This is the halfway point. We got to take a little second here. Oh, my God, man. John Ehrlichman um, was right. That is what Richard Nixon did. Um, it's what Joe Biden's doing to you right now. What Joe Biden is doing to you right now. <sighs> Ronald Reagan employed the myth of the welfare queen to anger white voters. This is not a myth. There, that was happening. That was a thing that was happening. So, 
As the New Republic put it, the welfare queen stood in for the idea that black people were too lazy to work instead of relying on public benefits to get by, paid for by the rest of us upstanding citizens. Okay, so there's propaganda behind it, but welfare queen is a real thing. That's a real thing. It's still a thing. <laughs> it's still a thing. And it's not just for black people. <laughs> I don't know who needs to hear this, but there are white people on welfare too. <laughs> <laughs> there are Spanish people on welfare. There are white people on welfare. There are Asian people on welfare. I'm sure there's not a lot of them, but there are. They exist. There are people out there on fucking food stamps who are white. Okay? Welfare queen does not mean black people. It means exactly what it means. It means you don't want to work and you rely on the public benefits to get by. That's, that is something that the, the rest of us upstanding citizens should be upset about. We should be upset about this. <laughs> this is so dumb. Uh, even this, even though, as the Economic Policy Institute pointed out, compared with other women in the United States, black women have always had the highest level of labor market participation, regardless of age, marital status, or presence of children at home. This is also very fucking true. This is very true. You'll notice it. You can notice that in your everyday life. In fact, working class white people have benefited most from assistance from the government. Again, true. These are all true facts. So why the hell is it racist? Why is it racist if it's wrong? How is it racist if it's not wrong? Uh, George W. George H. W., the old man, Ginned up fears of, of white women being raped by black former prisoners with his 1988 Willie Horton ad hammering home a tough on crime message. Oh, I see what we're saying here. We're saying that these are things that they do to ramp up white anxiety. That's what we're saying. So we're so basically what this so basically where we're going with this is that because you feel like this. Because you're like, the welfare queen stood in for the idea that black people were too lazy to work. Let's remove the black people. It, it, the welfare queen stood in for the idea that people, that poor people, were too lazy to work, instead relying on public benefits to get by, paid for by the rest of us upstanding citizens. So if you feel like that's bullshit, you have white racial anxiety. That's what that means. That's what they're trying to say with this article. If you feel as though it's fucked up that you have to work... And pay taxes so that people who don't work can get paid. You're fucking, you're a racist. You have white racial anxiety. So if you're a normal person, you're a racist. That's it. That's all that means. This is just normal people shit. No, I'm not happy when people are relying on public benefits when I have to work my ass off every week. Uh, what? I don't understand. Even Democrats got in the action during Bill Clinton's presidency with their crack baby mythology. Also a real thing and also very bad. Painting a dystopian portrait of an entire generation. Black children and young adults, they implied, were super predators. Who said that? Who called them super predators? I bet you if I open this up, it's going to say Joe Biden. What is this? What is this? Is it just like a, a video? Do we want to watch this real quick? Is it long? Oh, it's like five minutes long. Now we're good. Anyway, this is a Joe Biden thing called them super predators in the 90s, by the way. Your president. Not the racist other guy. The current guy called them super predators. Unrepentant, incorrigible criminals who roam the streets willing to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister... Beat up my wife, take on my sons. As then-Senator Joe Biden said. Yeah, he said that. Yeah, he said that. Why, are you calling him racist? Are we calling Joe Biden racist right now? Be careful, New York Times. It seems like you call him racist. This is a Republican talking point. So really, all I'm currently getting from this whole article so far is that the republicans got better
<laughs> the Republicans were really bad. They slowly got better. And the Democrats got worse over time. Hmm. Sarah Palin tried her best to other Barack Obama and make white people afraid of him. Palling around with terrorists. He was palling around with terrorists. This is true. At the time, these men were terrorists. Later on, they're considered freedom fighters. That's just how it works. She wasn't wrong at the time, but looking back on it now. At the same time, birthers were questioning if Obama was born in the United States and whether and wondering whether he was Christian or Muslim. Yeah, these were questions that I don't think were ever really answered, were they? Is Barack Obama a Muslim? I, it's not a problem if he is. I just, I don't know. I remember that being like a conversation, but I don't remember ever like getting a confirmation or not on it. I don't know. No, because they would have made a big deal about him being the first Muslim president, wouldn't they? I don't know. Then came Donald Trump, the chief, the chief birther, who ratcheted up this fear, appealed to obscene levels, positioning Mexicans as rapists and Muslims as people who hate America. He dispatched. This is wow. Okay. Do you notice how Joe Biden has an actual fucking quote of being racist? An actual quote of being racist. This is, an, this is a man being literal, a literal racist. And then here's just positioning Mexicans as rapists and Muslim people. Where's the quote? Where's the quote? Here's Joe Biden quoted being a racist. Where's, Joe, where's Donald Trump's quote of being racist? You can't put it there because it's not racist. Because what he said wasn't racist. He didn't say Mexicans were rapists. He says criminals are criminals. If you're crossing into the country illegally, you're a criminal. You're just as bad as a rapist. That's what he's saying. And he's right. That's how life works. If you're a criminal, you're a criminal. Uh, demonized black athletes and found some very fine people among the Nazis in Charlottesville. I, I still don't get this whole thing that happened here. I really don't get that. So it's no wonder Youngkin's critical race theory lie worked. It's not a lie. The parasite of white racial anxiety needed a new host, a fresher one. It's not a lie. See, a lot of people have been doing this thing where they're like, and, they're, and it's not even being taught in Virginia. It's not even being taught there. Well, one day it could be. It could be one day. And these people are worried about that. And they decided better nip this in the butt. I don't blame them. You could argue that the Democrats made missteps in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, could <gotcha. laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but to win, Democrats also need to tamp down white people's fears, which is like playing whack-a-mole. <laughs> Some of the very same people who voted against Donald Trump because they were exhausted and embarrassed by him turned eagerly to Youngkin because he rep rep represented some of the same ideals. But behind the front of congeniality, Youngkin delivered fear with a smile. All right. So fear. What are we afraid of? We're afraid of critical race theory. Not true. Fear is the wrong word. Now, if it is all white racial anxiety, which it could, you know what? This article kind of uh, tempered me a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. This some bullshit. We 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 were fucked up. We did we did some of this stuff. We definitely did. I don't know so much about this ad. This you know you didn't really have to kind of put on on that. Um, <laughs> the crack baby thing is hilarious. I remember that. I remember that. If you don't remember this, it's insane. It was an it was an insane time to be alive. But that all that being said, what's up with Virginia's Latino vote? What is up with it? Uh, Republican Glenn Youngkin pulled off an unthinkable in his victory against the for the Virginia governor race Tuesday. He won the Latino vote by roughly a dozen percentage points. Or perhaps not. Or perhaps not. Youngkin's impressive performance was one of the exit poll findings from the Associated Press vote cast. But according to Edison Research, which conducted the exit poll for the TV networks, uh, Terry McAuliffe crush Youngkin among Latino voters, carrying the group by a hefty 34 points. Okay. 
The chasm between these two findings offers an insight into one of the biggest and most consequential discussions in politics, the degree to which Republicans are making inroads with Latino voters. We're not going to go too far into this because we're slowly running out of time and I do want to do the last article. Um, but basically what we're saying is, is that the Democrats are losing Latinos rapidly at a rapid pace and they're trying their hardest to hurt, hold on to them. They're really trying their hardest to hold on to them. And they can't. They can't. Because do you want to know what Latinos are doing? They're starting to see through it. They're starting to see through it. And they're starting to see through it a lot more in these southern states where I think they're starting to learn that white people aren't all racist. Because these people are their neighbors. Because now they're realizing, well, holy shit, Becky brings me an apple pie every fucking holiday. Maybe this whole fucking racist thing that we're doing in fucking on the news is not true. These white people aren't that bad. Maybe that's what's happening. Maybe that's honestly what's happening. Maybe imagine you're, you're, you're a Cuban person in Florida and you're thinking to yourself, you're going, well, these fucking uptight, stuck up elites in New York and California are telling me to do one thing. I don't, I don't agree with those people. I just don't agree with those people. And that's kind of what's happening. You can't win these Latino people with, with rich and famous people because they don't care. They don't care. They don't care what fucking Taylor Swift is doing. They don't give a shit. They care about what you're actually doing to them because they've been, they've, they're from places where they do fucked up things to them. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being from fucking Ecuador and coming to the United States and being told, oh, you got to be careful. The white people, they're racist. And you're there for three months and you realize, no, they're not. And now you're sitting there and you're going, wait a second. Why the fuck was mom voting for Democrats? Because they said the white people are racist? This doesn't make any sense. This makes no sense. The, the honest truth of this is, is that this doesn't matter. What needs to happen is there needs to be the discussion of, the, like, look, this is so nuts. Did Glenn Youngkin really win among Latinos or did Terry McAuliffe crush him? So the answer is no. Terry McAuliffe did not crush him. Latinos voted, vote for Republicans in these southern states now. That's how this works. Get over it. It probably means that the Democrats are in trouble for a very long time. Because Joe Biden had the largest turnout of any president of all time. Barely won. Barely won. And the next person will not have that turnout. They will not. And the people that voted for Donald Trump will vote again. Because they didn't have to be forced to vote. They didn't have to have the fucking little stickers. They didn't have to have the flags. They didn't have to have the commercials. They didn't need that. They went out to vote because they believed in something. Granted, not the greatest thing to believe in, but they believed in it. And they will come out next time for what they believe in. You're not going to win every time by having Taylor Swift tell people to vote. It's not going to keep happening. We're not going to keep doing this. Because if this is what we get when we follow that, we're not happy. Speaking of what we get, Ethiopian rebels edge closer to Addis Ababa as fears grow over all-out war. So there's currently civil war going on in Ethiopia. Um, I'm praying for those people. I really, truly am. This is a terrible, terrible thing that's going on. Um, we can actually watch this video kind of outlining lining what's going on. It's a short three-minute video, and we do have the time. So I do want to actually do it. Let me make sure that we're getting volume for this. Uh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Let me just double check to make sure we have volume coming through. We do not. Why not? Because that's not right. Because this is right. Ah! All right. Maybe we won't watch it. I don't know why this isn't working. Okay. Well, regardless of what's going on, let's do... Uh, Let's take care of this thought process here. So what's currently happening? Well, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, I'm going to try to explain this the best that I can without the help of the video, because the video does a very good job, actually, of uh, explaining what's going on. So this is what happens when two evil groups of people clash. So Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, um, marking one-year war in Tigray, has pledged to bury his government's enemies with our blood. 
That's not great. If, you're, if your leader is saying, um, we're going to bury your government with our blood. Yeah, you kind of lost this guy, I think. Uh, Tigrayan rebels and troops allied against the Ethiopian central government are rapidly advancing on Addis Ababa, rising concerns that the capital could fall. And it will fall, I think, today. I think later on today, it will most definitely fall. Uh, this military force, the Tigrayan rebels, are strong, amazingly enough. They're actually very well armed. They're uh, very well organized. Um, I was talking about earlier about how they don't have a uh, centralized leadership, which is scary. Um, when, a, when a group, an organization like this doesn't have a, uh, a natural leader, we get worried about things like that. We really do. Because if a group takes over a country, the guy that comes out of it is usually not good. Is usually not good. Now, if a force rallies around a person with an idea, sometimes you can you, you get lucky and you get a good person out of that. Um, but when it's just a group of fucking people with guns, no. Nah, good stuff is not going to come out of this. Um, Ethiopian authorities on Tuesday announced a six-month nationwide state of emergency and called on citizens to take up arms to defend the capital. We're going to get into this. Uh, scary stuff, man. This is scary stuff. This is the stuff that you want to not happen to you. There's one new update, by the way, as well. We're going to get into that. Uh, the Tigray conflict has killed thousands, displaced over 2 million, fueled famine, and given rise to a wave of atrocities. This has been bad. It's been very, very bad. Let's get into the article. Um, when Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, he was lauded as a regional peacemaker. He was. Uh, he did a great thing with Northern Tigray. Uh, I thought he did, at least at the time. You know, there's other things going behind the scenes. We don't live there. Sometimes that's just what it is. You don't live there. You don't know. In November 2020, Abiy ordered a military offensive in the country's northern Tigray region and promised that the armed dispute would be resolved quickly. One year on, the fighting is threatening to spiral into an all-out war that could destabilize the wider region. So what basically what this man did is in November 2020, during a global pandemic, um, decided to attack these people. And they weren't having it. They're still not having it. Um, and it looks like they're going to win. He could have just not, right? He could have just not. That's kind of where the craziness comes into it. He could have literally just not. Ethiopia was struggling with significant economic, ethnic, and political changes long before a feud between Abiy and the region's former ruling party. The Tigray People's Liberation Front bubbled over into unrest. But now the escalating hostilities in other areas of Ethiopia, fears are growing that the fighting in Tigray could spark a wider crisis. It already has, I'm sure. Here's the update. Bang, 45 minutes ago. Rebels claim to be 15 miles from Ethiopian capital. It's over. So I assume this is going to be done within another hour. One of the rebel groups in Ethiopia claims to have forces about 25 kilometers from the center of the capital of Addis Ababa and says government troops are defecting to the rebels, but CNN cannot independently confirm either assertion. So they're, yeah, they're abandoning ship. This is over. Here he is. This is the guy. Odatar B, a spokesman from the Orman Liberation Front, tweeted late Wednesday, today, 1,165 Ormia Special Forces defected to the OLA. Wow. 400 of them joined OLA forces in vicinity of Lagatafo. Our forces continue pushing on from all directions. We are very close to seeing the end of this oppressive dictatorship. Well, it's going to be over soon. Um, I'm really wishing the people of Ethiopia uh, peace and harmony soon. This is not fun. It's not fun hearing gunshots outside of your house. It's not fun. You know, I don't think they're dropping bombs or anything crazy like that, but... There's fighting in the streets of the capital today. This is sad. This is a very, very, very sad day. The OLA is an outlawed armed group from Orma, Ethiopia's most populous region. Yeah, of course they are. They're the they're a terrorist organization. So this is what we talk about whenever we say a terrorist organization can very quickly become freedom fighters. Very, very quickly can become freedom fighters and even quicker can become governments. 
very quickly can become governments. So I am assuming that the OLA will be ruling Ethiopia soon. Uh, Lago Tafo lies just northeast of Addis Ababa, but an eyewitness in the town told CNN Thursday morning that there was no sign of rebel fighters there. Schools were in session as usual, and life seemed normal except for communication disruptions. Yeah, good for CNN for really getting the information. And a journalist based in Addis Ababa told CNN Thursday that the outskirts of the city were quiet with no rebel fighters visible. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They're there. Trust me, they're there. Why would why would they be unless they're trying to get some form of outside help? That's what I would assume would be the only reason to lie about this. I future military encounters are always very interesting because it's always a battle of information and this one in particular is a battle of information so cnn has no idea what's going on that's currently what we're kind of getting going here so people who can kind of see outside of the city so there's nothing going on i don't know i don't know you could be living on one side of a city and then the whole other side of the city could be destroyed and you'd have no idea and that's that's a truth <sighs> CNN has attempted to contact both the OLA and the TDF about their location of their fighters, but neither answered them on Thursday. What the would they answer you for? So you could post it on your website so that the fucking Ethiopians know? <laughs> <laughs> These are... You, we, we, got, we got information from people that they're not there. Like, yeah, of course, because they're literally with guns in their head right now. <laughs> Go, yeah, there's nobody here. There's nobody here. <laughs> so what's more likely do we think? Do we think that the rebels are lying? That they're not there? Right? Uh, the eyewitnesses are, are lying. And that the fighters are there. And that they're just been being told to not inform outside news networks. Which, <laughs> I mean, duh. I mean, fucking duh. <laughs> Which one do you guys think is more possible? Because <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb. Um, The state of emergency was interesting. I wanted to go over this. Uh, the provision originally announced the, by Ethiopian Attorney General uh, Gideon... I'm not even going to try this name. I'm not even going to try this name. Timothy Was? Eh, maybe. Timothy Was on Tuesday, allows for the conscription of citizens who own firearms and are of age for military service. Roadblocks, communication outages, the search and arrest of people deemed cooperating with terrorist groups, among other things. The age for military service in Ethiopia is 18. So basically, the Attorney General on uh, Tuesday told the people to take your guns and defend the city. Today, 1,100 special forces defected. That's a losing government, ladies and gentlemen. When you're telling your people to pick up guns to stop the terrorists, you lost. The fight's already over. The fight is already over. This move comes a year to the day after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered the military assault of Tigrayan forces in the north of the country that sparked the current conflict. <sighs> well, today's the day to feel bad for Mr. Ahmed. Um, he seems like he's going to be in a lot of trouble if he hasn't already been airshipped out. I don't know if he lives in the capital. He may not even live in the capital. Uh, Ethiopian uh, semantics are not my forte. I know where Ethiopia is on a map, if that helps. But other than that, um, trying to understand this. I understand humans. I understand humans. So if you, if you're releasing a provision that says that your 18 year old kid needs to pick a gun up and go kill the terrorists. You lost. 
you already lost. Because they say 18, but they mean 16. And they'll take 15. That's what that means. They say 18, but they mean 16, and they'll take 15. That's what that means. I'm not, I wouldn't do that either. I'd be, I'd be, uh, the minute the rebels came to my door, I'd go, hey, I'm with you guys now. He, I lo he lost me. He lost me. I got you guys. That's literally what's happening in this city right now. And I hope that it, I hope that it's as uplifting as that is. I really, truly do. I hope these people really get behind it and they don't, um, they don't settle. Do not settle for this ever. This man, this man orders an attack on his own country. His own country and then asks for the citizens to fucking help fight their own country. You, you literally sparked your own civil war. Global calls for grow, calls grow for an immediate ceasefire in Ethiopia. It's a devastating humanitarian crisis. Yeah, it's bad. As rebel forces have pushed the front line further south, the U.S. and the United Nations have also voiced their concern over the deteriorating situation. You need to let this happen. You need to let this happen. The problem is, is that they don't want this to happen. Because if this happens here, it, happen, it can happen anywhere. It can happen anywhere. And these people, the UN and the United States, they want to be able to hold, they want to reserve the right to be able to attack you. Remember that. They want to reserve the right to be able to go, eh, we could attack them if we wanted. Eh, there's rebels in Portland. Eh, blow city up. That's what they want. That's what they want to have. They want to have the power to be able to do that. We can't give them that. Can't give them that. So today we're praying for Mr. Ahmed. Um, I hope he... Edges out of this just fine, even though it's starting to appear as though he's some kind of uh, genocidal maniac. Um, until I know more, I do hope the best for him. I don't want to see anybody hurt. Um, I am currently rooting for the uh, OLA. I think I think the OLA has already won, so that could do. On Sunday, the group claims they had captured the key towns of Dese and Kambolacha. Yeah. It looks like they're probably going to win. And they're probably going to win either by tomorrow or the next day. Um, so, yeah. This is what's happening. This is the rest of the world. We're all at it. Well, that being said, we had a nice little day today. Um, I think some of the news is very important. What did we get out of it? Well, we got out of it, number one, that white racial anxiety is a real thing. Actually, I, I think it might actually be a real thing. I don't think it matters as much today as it did yesterday. Um, I think it means even less today than it meant yesterday. Uh, so I don't think um, Glenn Young can one because of, his, of white racial anxiety. I don't think that's why he won. I think he won because Democrats are failing this country. They failed Virginia and they're going to continue to fail this country if we don't push back. And the fact that they're able to go, this is just people being racist, is an immediate understanding of the fact that they don't think they're doing anything wrong. And if they don't think they're doing anything wrong and they're not, they're not accountable, then they're going to continue to do it. They're going to continue. So we have to vote against these people. We have to. I'm not even saying vote for Republicans because that's not even the answer because they're fucking shit too. Clearly. Clearly they're shit too. But we have to do something and we have to hold these people accountable. If the first good fucking nail is Glenn Youngkin, I hope it is. I really hope it is. I hope Mr. Youngkin is the best governor Virginia has ever had. I really, truly hope he is. And they should too. That's what these news networks should be saying. New York Times should be going, God, there's, there's a couple of good things about Glenn Youngkin that we could actually talk about and go... Maybe, maybe Virginia made the right choice. They won't do that. They won't do that because the tribalism is just way too strong. So we're not allowed to have the conversation. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here at the Michael Dorsey Show because we're going to continue to have these conversations. Um, next week, we're going to be on as we always are. Um, this was a great episode too. I think we had a, a really fun time. <laughs> I think there was some fun stuff that uh, went on in here. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, for one. Gave me the greatest answer of all time. I've been immunized. I'm just just say that to whoever from now on, whether you've been vaccinated or not. 
And they ask, just go, I've been immunized. Could mean anything. <laughs> it's, it, it could literally mean anything. Um, the $450,000 payments, as I predicted last week, is not a real thing. Um, the Latinos are voting for Republicans. I think that's just something that we need to accept now. Um, and lastly, we're praying for the uh, people of Ethiopia. Um, I hope them a good weekend. I really, really do. I hope they have a nice, peaceful, enjoyable weekend. Um, and I hope the same for you all. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. Follow the Twitch page for uh, these shows live because we do do them live. Um, and I am a mess live and on video. So you get to see that in person. Um, I do interact with chat sometimes in a little bit. Uh, it is going on on the right side of my screen. So I do read it. Uh, I don't necessarily reply to it. I wish I did. I could do more. We'll see. We'll see how everybody feels. But until next time, thank you all again. And we will see you all next time. Bye. And my thing doesn't work. That's fantastic.